Hello, history buffs. If you've been paying attention, or even if you haven't, you'll know that for the past two weeks there have been protests and riots because of the flagrant disregard for the lives of Black men and women in this country. In short, Black Lives Matter, and in long, what we're seeing across this country is the predictable outcome of oppression. But I am not here to explain Black Lives Matter. While I have lots of these conversations in real time, at work, about slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, civil rights, this is online. And that means that you can very easily either search videos by Black activists, Black historians, and hear what they have to say. They're more educated and more articulate on the matter than I am. I can also recommend several books, uh, both history and contemporary, and I'll link those down below. These are books that I have read and found very useful in understanding where have we been and where we are now. So this video isn't going to be about Black Lives Matter. And instead, this video is intended to give a little bit of a different perspective by breaking down and understanding a system of oppression that white Americans can really get behind smashing. In fact, we revel in having smashed it. We celebrate holidays about having smashed it. We write books and TV shows and musicals about having smashed it. We like to tell and sell the story about having smashed it so well that we have smashed it permanently. We are talking about the system which brought colonies into existence and which made living in colonies intolerable. We are talking about mercantilism. English and it's 1607. Your country is ruled by James I and your money has his face on it. Your gold money. The economy is a little bit different in 1607 than it is in 2020 and not just because they don't have Bitcoin yet. Your money is gold and gold is money which means it is incredibly inelastic. You can't make more, you can't grow more, you can't find more. This means the amount of money is never going to change. However, the value of money is subject to change. This is to say that price is determined by matching specie, which is the precious metal being used as currency, to the supply of goods. This is a little bit different from how we're used to thinking about money, but that's okay, because the real wealth doesn't come from the coin, but from the purchasing power the stuff you can buy with it. For example, in town you have 20 pounds and 20 cows, and so you price them at one pound each. A twentieth of the money will buy a twentieth of the cows. But maybe you have a really good year, and all your cows become mamas all at once, and now you've got 40 cows. Well, a twentieth of the gold is still going to buy you a twentieth of the cows, but now a twentieth of the cows is two cows, not one. So your gold is going to buy you more cows. Or, you know, an equivalently priced amount of anything. I'm just using cows as a simple example to get us all warmed up. So you're English, it is 1607, and for a while now you've noticed that prices have been going up. And this is very annoying because it's not like your town has extra gold going around to make up for these high prices. So you start wondering, what's up with that? For the last century, Spain and Portugal have had territories in the New World, meaning that they've had more access to more mines and more gold. They bring that gold back home and flood the European market with it. 
Suddenly, Spain and Portugal have more purchasing power than anywhere else in Europe. And it's not because they're producing more. It's not because there's more to buy. I cannot stress this enough. Mercantilism is not about the stuff you can buy. It is about your ability to buy it. In order for there to be more to buy, you would have to have an increase in productivity, but for right now, there's just an increase in gold. As a purely local example, a Spanish village might start out the century with 20 cows and 780 real, and end the century with 20 cows and 1560 real. The cow is still worth a 20th of the gold, there just happens to be more gold with which to buy cows. But trade doesn't just happen within villages. It happens between villages, and there's taxes to pay, and there's international trade to consider. The prices in one part of the world are going to impact prices in another part of the world. And while you might not go all the way to France to buy a cheap French cow instead of an expensive Spanish cow, there are other goods that are more susceptible to this international influence. And this brings us all the way back to those rising prices in England. You, the English peasant in 1607, go to the market, and you see that an Italian trader has brought several yards of silk fabric, and you think, excellent, silk is warm, it's durable, it breathes, and I want some. So you go and you ask him how much some silk is going to cost, and he quotes you a price, and you cannot believe how high it is. That is more than you thought that fabric should be worth, and you ask him, why? And he explains that this is the price that he can fetch when he's in Portugal. And you can't match it. You just don't have the gold. So you start heading home, having not been able to buy the silk. When you hear some news, England is about to get some colonies. Good, you think to yourself. We can use a little more purchasing power. <sighs> have you heard this news from Boston? It's, it's just terrible. Three ships worth of cargo all lost in the same night? It's uncivilized. It's barbaric. In the 17th century, American colonies belonged to the Netherlands, England, France, Spain, and Portugal. These countries were in competition for the largest share of the European market. Not all of this competition was fiscal, plenty of it was military, but a lot of it was fiscal. And as we saw in part one, in order to dominate the European economy, you have to have the most gold. It's not that there's more European stuff to buy, but if you have 60% of the gold in Europe, Europe, you can buy 60% of the stuff in Europe. The potential that's all tied up in the specie is power. But here's the catch, and this is something that any child knows. If you spend the money, you no longer have the money, and you no longer have the power that goes with that money. It's not all about keeping your gold and silver in a national treasury per se, but it is about limiting foreign trade and therefore losing specie to foreign countries, except when importing raw materials and specialty items that cannot be made at home. It is about exporting your expensive finished goods and bringing other countries' gold back home. It is about otherwise trading domestically to maintain a vibrant economy. There is a more specific answer, though, to who gets to play the game, and that is kings. In the 17th century, monarchies are the order of the day, and their power is only becoming more distilled. Spain was relatively recently united under one crown. In France, you have Louis XI and Louis XIV collecting and calcifying monarchical power. In Britain, you have Thomas Hobbes writing Leviathan and arguing that not only does monarchy make sense, but absolute monarchy is the only government that makes sense. I point this out because there is an essential link between governments and economics. Governments make policies about economics, and in turn, economics bolsters and influences government power. This isn't a revolutionary idea, but it's an important one. Further, there is a blatant egoism to nationality, which exists under a monarch, which does not exist as fully under a democracy. Democracies have to at least seem like they are beholden to their people, whereas a monarchy can amass power for power's sake. In a country run by an individual, Policies will first and foremost benefit that individual and their family. Afterwards, the people whom he needs to stay in power. 
After that, the people who could take away his power, and then finally, the people who are no threat to that power. These people at the bottom are people from whom he can siphon wealth without any fear of repercussion. There's so much anger in these words, and I can see where they're coming from. I'd be angry too if I felt oppressed, but destruction of private property isn't the answer. Who's going to be hurt by this? It certainly isn't King George. If you are in charge of a European empire, then you are only as powerful as your empire is unified. Individuals might be tempted to do things like import cheaper goods from another country. Colonists might try to set their own policies. This is absolutely unacceptable because it threatens to weaken your empire as compared to the other empires. In a free market, which is what we are used to today, you make the best product you can, as cheaply as you can, and people will prefer it to other inferior products. I mean, we do have a fair amount of regulations over what you can sell and to whom you can sell it, but we still operate within a free market. European mercantile empires were not free markets, and I am not talking about a finger on the scale either. I mean, if you brought the scales to the conversation, they would ask you what the scales were for, and when you told them what the scales were for, they would laugh in your face. There are a few mechanisms by which an empire can maintain a good trade balance. You might be familiar with the concept of importing less than you export, and that is a good start. However, you can take this a step further by only importing raw materials like fur, wood, and cotton. First, raw goods are cheaper than finished products, and so you can make more money when you sell things like hats, cabinets, or clothing. Second, your citizens are now doing more specialized labor than picking, trapping, and chopping. So if all European countries follow this model, they should have plenty of goods to trade with each other, right? Well, a good monarch is going to want to quash that too, and for the same reason. They do want to sell things abroad, make no mistake, but importing? Not so fast. Importing goods breaks the cardinal rule of mercantilism. If you spend your gold, you don't have your goal. But you might not want to ban trade entirely, so this is where tariffs come in. Sometimes they're called protective tariffs, sometimes they're called import tariffs, but they're all the same thing. If you want to think about it this way, you can protect your industry by taxing imports. Here is an example. It is 1828 and you live in a state that does not make maple syrup, but you want some maple syrup because of course you do. Maple syrup costs a dollar and you want some Quebec maple syrup because it is the best maple syrup. And you go to market and you see that there is some from Quebec and there is some from Vermont. And the Quebec maple syrup costs a dollar forty-two and the Vermont maple syrup costs a dollar. In 1828, the U.S. Congress passes the Tariff of Abominations, which is a 42% import tariff on all things from outside this country. This means that when you import the Quebec maple syrup, it's going to have 42 cents added to the price that goes to the U.S. government. So if you buy the Quebec maple syrup, you end up paying 42 cents to the U.S. government in tax. So you decide to buy the Vermont maple syrup after all, the tariff works, and local industry is encouraged. However, during colonial times, Americans and Canadians weren't allowed to trade with each other because colonies weren't allowed to set their own international policies. You're probably familiar with the pyramid power structure model. I used a variation of it earlier, but let's flesh it out just a little bit. You have your king on top, then your aristocracy comes next, your professionals, your peasants, your slaves, and I'm going to add a layer down at the bottom, and these are your colonies. I'm placing them down at the bottom, not because colonial planters were lower than English peasants, because they're not. And of course, just because I'm putting all colonial subjects at the bottom of the pyramid doesn't mean that there are not hierarchies within colonialism. One big difference within white Americans is the people who choose to come to the Americas versus the people who are forced to. If you're wealthy or if you have enough money to strike out on your own in a new country, then you're coming by choice. Other people weren't so lucky. The state of Georgia was originally a penal colony, which means that the people who were moving there were already poor and already were failed by the state. 
In Quebec, many of the early women settlers were prostitutes, and these were people who were considered unwanted in France. And of course, they are the people who were kidnapped and enslaved and brought to this country in chains. And of course, we can't forget about the people who were already living here, who were displaced and killed for their land. Everybody suffers when they're on the colony side of a mercantile system, but not everybody suffers equally. The colonies themselves were very diverse in terms of personal wealth, language, religion, race. Sometimes this led to some really interesting combinations of cultures. Other times, this ended in genocide. This does not change the fact that colonies exist to enrich an empire. If you are an empire, the larger your territory is, the more wealth you have, and the more powerful you are as an entity. This is how tiny countries like the Netherlands and Portugal are able to keep up with big countries like France and Spain. It's like having double the citizens with zero the having to care. And now they didn't think this through. The East India Company might belong to the king, but the merchants themselves are private citizens. They're the ones who took the risk by going all the way to China. Three different merchants lost their cargo? That is years out of their life. And of course they're going to have to pay their sailors. And what about the dock workers? Those are part of Boston's own community. If they're not able to work, they're not going to be able to pay their lodgings. They're not going to be able to feed their families. They need to be able to work. And since all of this cargo was thrown overboard the ships in the middle of the night, they're not going to be able to have this work to do. This is the local economy. I doubt they were on the minds of the Sons of Liberty. Now, you might very well be thinking, hold on, I know that there are all kinds of different jobs done in colonial times, because I've been to Colonial Williamsburg, and I know that there were chandlers, and bookbinders, and printers, and hat makers, and all kinds of different finished products had to be made in colonial times. And you're right. Colonial America was a period of 170 years on the East Coast, and twice that on the West Coast. And in all of that time, it was wasn't just miners and farmers shipping stuff back to the mother country. In that time, land was privatized, families came together, schools and universities were founded, literature was written, life happened. Generations of people were born in and died in colonial America, and it wasn't the same all the way through. Jamestown in 1630 was very different from Philadelphia on the eve of revolution, when it was the second largest city in the whole British Empire. Industry was vibrant because most trade was still local. The caveat was that Americans were not able to sell their cloth and their hats and their wigs and their silver cups and their glass and everything else that they made overseas. They could not control things like exports, and England only wanted to take the raw goods. But even in an empire, you still have to meet the basic needs of life. You'll remember from part one that on a local level, the amount that things cost is determined by the amount of money you have and the amount of stuff you have. As an example, let's say that you're a potter in Western North Carolina. You make jugs and mugs and pots and all kinds of different earthenware stuff. Maybe you sell a dinner set that costs a pound and that's kind of on the low side. You wouldn't be able to survive on that in Wilmington but you don't live in Wilmington, so it's fine. Your community is pretty far from any city or port, and so you don't get a lot of trade done. You know what money is worth, and you know that you're going to be able to afford your wheat and your shoes and all the stuff you need. But the bad news is that even in small communities in provincial colonies, you're going to have some outside trade eventually, and it's never going to be in the colony's favor. Now, Sons of Liberty, that's an interesting choice in name a little bit on the nose, and also not particularly accurate if you ask me. You don't go around hiding your identity and committing crimes in the name of liberty. You can't do such things and expect to come down on the right side of history. And speaking of law, they can't imagine that they won't be punished by this, can they? They might not have been caught in the act, but surely the army and the guards in town will be increased. First destruction of property and then what next? Arson? I can't imagine that increased military force is the outcome that they wanted, but what else could they have expected? Economics in general, and mercantilism in particular, are never separate from nation and government. There will always be an interplay between economics, international policy, declaring war, and responding effectively to the needs of the neighbors with whom you share borders or even territory. 
The trouble for colonial governments is while they have territorial neighbors, they don't have the authority to set international policy and to resolve problems as they arrive with their neighbors. Conversely, they also get swept up in policies and events that don't benefit them. A famous example of this is the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, just depending on what region you're from. From a Franco-Anglican point of view, this was a necessary proxy war to have. From a colonial point of view, however, it's been almost a hundred years of warfare between French territories and English territories. It's starting to feel pretty futile since the disputes aren't even about Virginia or French Louisiana or Quebec. We're tired of fighting these wars, and we're tired of being taxed to pay for these wars. These wars aren't our preference, they're not our fault, and they don't benefit us in any way. If you're living in North America, you're probably feeling pretty alienated from the bodies which make policies and govern your life. And this is more or less fine until it just isn't. First, the colonies get more profitable over time. Life in Philadelphia in 1770 is very different from Jamestown in 1630, and the king wants his cut. Second, we no longer have a simple import-export system. As empires get more globalized, there's a more intricate trade network. If anything, this puts colonists at a greater disadvantage. Crown companies can now expect colonists to purchase goods from all over the world with their already limited funds. And third, these new Enlightenment ideas keep coming around, like voting and citizenship and free speech. Maybe you as a colonist want to participate in it. But maybe you're just not British enough. Now, if they were really serious about what they're trying to do, they would write petitions, they would gain audiences, they would not hide their identities in the middle of the night to destroy private property. There's a right way and a wrong way of doing things, and as far as I'm concerned, that in doing this, they have forfeited any right they have to be taken seriously. I mean, who wants brutes in Parliament? I certainly don't want to be represented by a brute who got voted in by other brutes. If this question was asking if colonists loved tea and hated the French, it would be a lot easier to answer. What the question is really asking is, do they count? The answer is somewhere between British enough to tax, but not British enough for representation in Parliament. British enough to serve in the armed forces, not British enough to be considered when making foreign policies. British enough to be considered a captive market when it comes time to sell Indian tea, but not British enough to set their own economic policies or be considered when setting economic policies to benefit British people. They were just British when convenient. This convenience factor is why I tuck the whole colonial system underneath the main body of the pyramid. The colonial system was a mercantile centrifuge used to siphon wealth away from colonists back to the Isle of Britain. The same policies which ensure that the British get to compete in Europe are going to keep the American colonists as poor as possible. When your currency is gold and silver and inelastic, wealth is a zero-sum game. This is a systemic disadvantage. More industry and more productivity do not yield more wealth because international trade is limited in sending raw goods back to stimulate the mother country's economy. There is no end game and there is no winning. The only way to win is not to play. You can live free or die. This conundrum plays a part in the philosophy of the American Revolution. Originally, colonists wanted to be more British, not less. They wanted representation in Parliament, and they wanted more power within the British system. When that wasn't realized, and as the revolution progressed, thoughts changed. Thought leaders and politicians started to talk about becoming a nation of their own. But there was one who famously did not change his mind. When the British government started having conversations about giving parliamentary representation to the colonists, and the revolutionary leaders stuck with their new ideas rather than their old goals, Benedict Arnold switched sides. He's famous as a turncoat, a mercenary, and a traitor, but as the ideas and philosophies of the revolution changed around him, he stuck his course. Unless, of course, their goal is quite different from what they say. Perhaps their goal is simply to tear down civilization. That's a lot easier than building something new up. And of course there are problems with our society. I'd be the first one to admit that not everybody gets their fair shake. But it is still the best system that we have ever invented. All of history, from the Greeks to the modern day, thousands of years of progress have come to this. And you can hardly say we've learned nothing in all that time. What was it all for if we tear it down now? 
Are we really going to let these riots get in the way of civilization? There is some debate as to whether the American Revolution was a revolution or if it was instead a war of independence. There's a different connotation here, but there's also a practical difference to get into. One argument goes that it was a war of independence because by the end, the powerful were still powerful, the rich were still rich, and the power structures did not change. And yes, the rich stayed rich, but the revolution wasn't against wealth disparity. This revolution was against an alien power which disadvantaged the colonies economically, militarily, diplomatically. Another, <laughs> another argument goes that the revolution could not have been a revolution because Marxist class structures weren't invented yet. <laughs> which, first of all, if your political theory can't even account for the things that have already happened, there is a problem with that political theory. And second, since when are European philosophers the only ones who get to define things? Of course a European definition of revolution is not going to account for being at the bad end of a mercantile arrangement because European countries were on the good end of the mercantile arrangement. So of course their philosophies aren't going to account for that. Revolution is about dismantling unjust hierarchies, and the American Revolution was against the unjust hierarchy of mercantilism. By the end of the war, the people who lived in the 13 colonies, rich and poor alike, were no longer beholden to the unfair trade agreements which were created to benefit another nation. They got to set their own international and trade policies, while not having to buy luxury goods they couldn't afford and pay taxes to benefit another people. This changes the game. And of course, Americans did then and still do today have a lot to sort out socially, politically, economically, but this does get rid of that top layer. They don't have to pay overhead anymore. A lot of focus is placed on the war parts of the War of 1812, but not as much is placed on the trade elements of the war. While Napoleon and his merchant navy were all kept continent side, the whole French empire was open to trade. And for the first time in America, North or South, we got to trade internationally. This brief window in history gets us some of the first American millionaires. And wealth disparity aside, as colonies, we were forced to buy tea in order to enrich England. But 40 years later, we were enriching ourselves. But it looks like the tea has brewed. Can I offer you a cup? again thank you all so much for watching to the end of this video I hope you enjoyed this little journey about mercantilism uh, if you enjoyed yourself don't forget to give me a like maybe subscribe if you know any history buffs who like content like this send this video or anything else that I do their way uh, until next time make history